Hello everybody and welcome to this A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough where I'm going to be taking a look at some questions about intermolecular forces. In this video I will talk out loud the thinking behind the question and write my thoughts down and any annotations in blue and then I'll write down in green what you need to say to get the marks for each question. So I suggest you pause the video at the start of each page, have a go at the question yourself, and then press play and see what I think about each of the questions. So this first question is asking about intermolecular forces in general, and they ask us to give the meaning of the term electronegativity, which gives rise to one of the three types of intermolecular force. And electronegativity is the power of an atom to attract a pair of electrons in a covalent bond. That N bit is really important, often overlooked. You need to say it is a covalent bond. And then the follow-up question says, explain how permanent dipole-dipole forces, that's the middle force in terms of strength, how that arises between hydrogen chloride molecules. And so the first thing that you need to say about permanent dipole is you need to say that it is because of this difference in electronegativity that you get bond polarity. And so just to show that in a diagram, what I mean by that is we've got the hydrogen bonded to the chlorine, and because the chlorine is electronegative, more electronegative than hydrogen, the electrons are pulled to the right-hand side, and that makes chlorine electron-rich and the hydrogen electron-deficient. And so that is the dipole that we've just described for the first mark. And then, so the second mark is that we need to say that there is an attraction between the delta positive in one molecule, so this delta positive hydrogen here, will be attracted to the delta negative in an adjacent molecule. And so if I draw that adjacent molecule just for explanation purposes, here is the delta positive hydrogen, delta negative chlorine, and so there is an attraction between the chlorine and the hydrogen in two adjacent molecules. It doesn't have to be that way around, you could have a hydrogen chloride over here, and that would be attracted in the exact same way. And so whilst that diagram I've drawn at the bottom in blue is not necessary for these two marks, it might be that a question could say, draw a diagram to show how this permanent dipole arises. And then if that was the case, you could draw this molecule attracted to this one or this molecule attracted to this one, depending on what you fancy doing. This next question obviously is about van der Waals forces and we've been told that they exist between all simple molecules. So sometimes they don't tell you that and so it's helpful that they've given us that information here. And what they've asked us to do is explain how these forces arise. So I think it's useful here to remember that van der Waals forces can also be referred to as temporary dipole induced dipole forces and actually that could get us two of these three marks because what happens is that in one molecule if I just draw a molecule here as a sort of I don't know a sausage sort of shape so here's a molecule and it's got some electrons and these electrons are constantly moving around and if because of random arrangement of electrons we might have I'm not going to draw loads let's say we've got five electrons at one end of this molecule and one electron at the other. That is going to make this end of the molecule electron rich temporarily because these electrons will move away again in a moment and so the other end will be electron deficient. So that's what we mean by the temporary dipole induced dipole and that's caused by electron movement in this first molecule. And so what that does is that causes the electrons in a neighbouring molecule to move around in a particular way. That induction means to cause to happen. And so on this occasion, how I've drawn it here, the electrons in the left-hand molecule will repel the electrons in the right-hand molecule. And so we'll end up with more electrons on the right-hand side of this second molecule as well, because the electrons will get repelled this way. And that is what the induction is the repulsion of these electrons. And it can work the other way around as well. I've just chosen to show it in this um, repulsion direction. And so for the first two marks, we need to just simply say that we've got the electron movement in the first molecule or a temporary dipole 
inducing a dipole in the second molecule. And then for the final mark, similarly to the previous question, we just need to say that there is an attraction now between the electron-rich delta-negative region in one molecule and the electron deficient region in an adjacent molecule or in adjacent molecules. This is going to happen over a bigger scale, not just between one and another, really. It would be in all of the molecules in a particular mixture that they're near to. And so the second question brings us on to look at some specific types of molecule. We've got methanol and me methane thiol, which has got sulfur in, and we've been given their boiling points. And so methanol is obviously much, much greater than methane thiol, 65 and 6 respectively. And so what we're asked to do is explain in terms of their intermolecular forces why the boiling points of these compounds are different. And so what we're expecting here is that one of these molecules has got the strongest type of intermolecular force, such as hydrogen bonding, and the other one hasn't got that type of intermolecular force. And that is what we're going to find here. But let's explore the methodology. So first of all, we are looking for whether or not something has got hydrogen bonding. And the way that I recommend that you remember how to do that is that you remember that for hydrogen bonding, you need two specific criteria. You need a delta positive hydrogen and you need a very electronegative atom such as fluorine, oxygen or nitrogen. In fact, those are the three that you need to know about for your A-level course. And one of the characteristics of these, as well as being electronegative, is that they have got a lone pair of electrons. So this is our sort of checklist. And so what we need to do is we need to look at methanol and we need to say, OK, does it have a delta positive hydrogen? And the answer will be yes, it's got this one that's attached to the oxygen. And so in terms of the bonding, it would be this oxygen bonded to the hydrogen and that would definitely be electron deficient and that would be electron rich. And so we've got one tick. We do have the delta positive hydrogen and we do also have the electron rich oxygen with its lone pair. So that means that methanol would have hydrogen bonding. That's our first mark. Then we need to move on to the methane thiol. And so instantly we can see that this won't have hydrogen bonding because it doesn't have the fluorine, the oxygen or the nitrogen. It does have sulfur. So we would probably expect sulfur and hydrogen to have different electronegativities. So we would really expect this to have dipole, dipole forces or permanent dipole, dipole forces is better. But they do actually allow you in, in questions like this to kind of have have it both ways, really. And so you could say that it's got van der Waals forces only as well, because you're not expected to actually know the specifics in this situation. And so once we've set the scene and we've said methanol has got hydrogen bonding, methane thiol has got the permanent dipole dipole forces. The final mark is coming from the fact where we say hydrogen bonds are stronger than dipole dipole or they are the strongest intermolecular force. The next question is just a simple one that you need to just remember the answer to this one. And it's asking us how we could separate this mixture. And it doesn't really matter what the mixture is of, in fact. All that really matters is that our mixture has got different boiling points. And when that's the case, the answer is quite simply distillation, or if you prefer, fractional distillation. But simple distillation is absolutely fine here. And then the final question on this page is asking us to make a suggestion. And when they say suggest, that means that you don't actually know the definite answer to this, but you're expected to make an educated suggestion based on what we know from elsewhere in the course. And so we've now got methane selenol, which has got selenium instead of the sulfur, which is present in methane thiol. And we've been asked to explain why the methane selenol has got a higher boiling point than the methane thiol. And so we would expect them to both have the same intermolecular forces in terms of dipole-dipole or van der Waals. So why would we have one with a bigger force than another? And this is kind of like an alarm bell here that is quite a common question. And this is down to the fact that the van der Waals forces in one molecule will be stronger than the van der Waals forces in the other. And it's very nice here. They've told us which one it is that's going to have the higher boiling point. So what we're invited to assume is that the methane selenol has got stronger van der Waals forces than the methane thiol. 
And we can make that assumption because they've told us that one has got a higher boiling point than the other. But we can also look at positions in the periodic table and that we can see from the relative atomic mass of selenium that the methane selenol molecule will be bigger or it will have a larger MR or it will have a bigger number of electrons. Any one of those different answers is absolutely fine. That is the cause for what we were able to deduce, which is that the van der Waals forces must be stronger. So for two marks, we can say in no particular order that the methane selenol will be a bigger molecule or any of those other options. And as a result of that, that will give them stronger van der Waals forces between their molecules. This final question is quite a tricky question. It's a six marker. We're not going to end up using anywhere near as much of this space as they've given to us, but it requires quite a lot of complexity of thinking, and we actually need to use our knowledge of um, different types of intermolecular force, but also different types of bonding as well. They've asked us to suggest with reasons the order of the melting point, so that's going to give us one mark, and then we've got five marks worth of reasons. So let's dive in and look at the type of structure of these substances. So we've got bromine, which is Br2. Bromine is a non-metal. So we're expecting the bromine molecules to be simple molecular or simple molecules. And then moving on to strontium chloride. Strontium is a group two metal. Chlorine is a non-metal. So we're expecting this to be an ionic compound and it's going to have its ionic lattice structure. And then last of all, iodine monochloride, ICL, they are both non-metals. So once again, this is going to be simple molecular. So we've established the type of structure. And then what we need to establish is what actually are we doing when we melt each of these different types of structure. And so for ionic substances, what you are doing in ionic substances is you're overcoming the electrostatic attractions between these positive and negative ions in their three-dimensional lattice. I've not drawn very many atoms there, but you get the idea, sorry, ions, and that is going to continue on and on and on with lots of different ions. So you're breaking that electrostatic attraction that exists between each of those ions. Whereas when you've got your simple molecular substances, all you're doing there when you're separating two molecules, which is all melting is, just making sure the separation between those molecules is a little bit bigger than before, what you're doing is you're breaking those intermolecular forces between those molecules, which is much easier to do. The most common mistake in a question like this would be to talk about breaking covalent bonds. That's absolutely not the case here. When something melts or when it boils, it is still the same substance. So if you imagine ice, which is obviously solid water, when you melt ice, what you get is, of course, liquid water. So you haven't broken any covalent bonds. What you've done is you've broken those intermolecular forces or overcome the forces, if you want to steer clear of using the word break. And then when you boil a kettle and steam comes out of the kettle, steam is just water vapour. So once again, it's water in the gas form. So you've not broken any covalent bonds. You've just overcome those intermolecular forces. And so the electrostatic attractions in this ionic lattice are much stronger than intermolecular forces. So that would put strontium chloride in firmly in first position. So in terms of writing it in order of their melting point, strontium chloride is going to be number one. And then to decide between the other two, we need to talk about the different types of intermolecular force. Now, as we know, there are three. Bromine, Br2, does not have any hydrogen bonding because it can't. Same with iodine monochloride. No hydrogen bonding possible in that molecule because there is no electron deficient hydrogen. Then we move down to the second, which is permanent dipole-dipole. That absolutely would not exist in bromine because they are both the same atom. So they're both going to have the same electronegativity. And so no permanent dipole-dipole forces there, which means the only force that will exist within bromine, so between bromine molecules, will be van der Waals forces. And we know that that's the case because they are in everything. Whereas when we look at iodine and chlorine, because they do have different electronegativities, they are going to be 
definitely having a dipole within their molecule, and so there will be permanent dipole-dipole forces between their molecules. And so now we've got our hierarchy. We've got strontium dichloride, which is definitely going to be first, followed by the ICL, because that's got the permanent dipole-dipole forces, and then last of all on our list will be bromine in third position. So we've now got our first mark, which is just simply for the order. And then we need to say why. Well, so strontium chloride, let's tackle that one first. That has got an ionic lattice, which has got very, very strong ionic bonds or strong electrostatic attraction between the ions. Those are both fine. And there are many, many of these strong bonds to overcome, which is why its melting point will be so high. So that's the next two marks out of our six. And then for the next mark, we need to talk about the permanent dipole-dipole that is in ICL, whereas bromine has only got van der Waals forces, and wrap that all up by saying that permanent dipole-dipole forces are stronger than the van der Waals forces that are present in bromine. So each one of these is essential to add up to our total of six marks. OK, that's everything for this video. Don't forget to leave a comment if you want to request a particular question walkthrough or explanation video, and I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.